has long been involved in the development of futures-oriented educational change with a win-win philosophy of choice. He has steadfastly stated that if schools and universities are to be significantly better, they must be significantly different. While serving as the director of the non-graded Wilson School and College and the co-director for the Center of Alternatives and Experiential Learning at the Minnesota State University of Mankato, he was recognized by the National Observer as the foremost apostle of educational innovation. Started in 1968, Wilson was acknowledged as the most innovative public program in the United States. People from all over the world came to view this model of innovation. His efforts to eliminate the impossible traditional seventh grade, <clears throat> excuse me, with its 13 year test score range and six year physiological spread helped to create the original non-graded four year middle school design. As a futurist, he was an advisor for a lifelong learning system without schools for the planned Minnesota experiential, experimental city. And he was a co-founder of the National Association for Year-Round Education. As the first person hired by a school district and later at <clears throat> a state at a full-time consultant for innovation, he was labeled by Kappen Magazine as the Vice President for Educational Heresy <laughs> as he created personalized learning paths at all age levels. Don is the author of many books in his 2012 book, Declaring War Against Schooling, Personalizing Learning Now describes our archaic 100-year-old schooling system and offers solutions for overcoming the political barriers preventing personalized learning options for our students. Minnesota Association of Alternative Programs awarded him for exemplary lifetime contributions. Both the Wilson School and the College Program and the Don Glines Archives are housed in the Memorial Library at the University, or excuse me, at the Minnesota State University, Mankato. I had once heard someone say, an expert is someone who has been there and done that, not someone who has a lot of opinions. Don has been there, he has done that, and he has led the way ever since. He has never apologized for doing what is right for learning, and I believe that he will demand that we do the same. It truly is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce to you one of the nation's foremost leaders in innovative education, Mr. Don Glines. <laughs> Thanks, Craig. I told and the important people are introduced like Mr. President or here's Johnny, you know. We didn't need all that kind of stuff moving on. It's great to be back in Minnesota and with MAP. Uh, I know many of us personally. Uh, I know the great programs we have and the fine efforts we're making for the students uh, in our MAP programs and the fine organization that we have. Uh, so that what we're involved in um, doing I know that we're getting very frustrated with the legislature in Minnesota and the various rules and regulations that we've are going on. So what we're going to do today is start the second great revolution, education revolution, in Minnesota. And uh, we're... <laughs> you may not agree with all my proposals and my ideas, but that's okay. If you don't agree with mine, come up with your own. But the key... <laughs> But the key is, we've got to act. We can no longer sit around and talk. To help us get started today and create the new revolution, uh, I brought along my best friend and advisor, Figment. He is going to, if you, if you don't have a Figment in your school, in your program, on your desk, you know, in, in your bed or wherever, you, you're, you're just are, are out of it, you know. Figment is the one that, keeps us going. Uh, he's going to take us on a journey into the Center for Imagination. He's going to teach us how to imagineer. Imagineer. Imagine, invent, and implement. We're going to imagine what should be in Minnesota. Then we're going to invent how to get it done. And then we're going to actually go ahead and do it. Well, before Figment takes us on to our journey into the future, I want to um, review just a couple of points of our first great revolution uh, in education in Minnesota that occurred back uh, a few years ago. Uh, I wore a suit today purposely because a suit, believe it or not, helped to create the first great revolution in Minnesota. 
And when I talk about great revolutions, I'm talking about the last 60 years or so. I don't know, something in 1890 might have happened that I'm not familiar with. But so let's just talk about the past 60 years, 1950 on. Uh, and uh, how did this suit influence the direction of uh, education in Minnesota? Uh, in 1967, the Damien Report came out and said that if you want to see something exciting or innovative or better or different in education, you had to go outside the state. There was nothing going on in Minnesota that was worth visiting. That's the report that came out, big public report in 1967. Well, it wasn't true, but we didn't like it. So in 1968, we decided to start a new revolution and our first great revolution then of the modern era. And uh, as a result of that, uh, one of the catalysts for this great revolution, we held the North Country Festival at McAllister College in October 1969. And uh, at that time, uh, and the establishment kind of feeling was that you had to wear dungarees and and lumberjack shirts and boots and stuff. You wear beards if you are a male. You had to wear granny dresses and high top shoes and <laughs> braided hair or straggly hair, you know, to be an established. Remember, it was shortly after the Civil Rights Act and Vietnam and so forth. It was more of the free school kind of spirit. Well, a couple of gals from the Education Exploration Center, uh, two young women that with no money uh, had a storefront little office down in Minneapolis. Uh, organize this you know, conference, it cost you $20 to get in if you were affluent and $10 to get in if you were poor. Well, uh, we had uh, some great sessions like we've had here. Uh, we had some great speakers, the, the radicals like George Dennison was here, Lives of Children, uh, uh, James Hearn was here, uh, uh, the way it's supposed to be. Uh, Charlie Orngardner was here in terms of teaching its subversive activity. So we had some fine activities going on those two days. Well, I began to feel a little uncomfortable. I just didn't seem to, I fit in, you know? And so I was to give the Sunday morning closing sermon. And I decided uh, I just can't do this. Uh, so I went back to Mankato and I got out an old blue suit and a bow tie, which I wore in those days. It shows I can change. I got a brown suit and a long tie now. And, and, and wore a white shirt. And I showed up Sunday morning to give the sermon at the gym, the old gym at McAllister College. We didn't have chairs and stuff like this. Uh, the guy, the, all the people were sitting on the floor uh, on old gym mats, sitting on parallel bars and so forth. We didn't have any PowerPoint presentations. We didn't, have, didn't even have a lectern, you know. I, I, I walked up and here's this vertical bar, you know, that I was supposed to operate on in the gym. And when I walked up with my blue suit, you could just hear the moans. Oh, God, who's this guy? Where, where's the exits? I started looking around you know, for, the, for the exits. Well, I jumped up right away and started in, and I gave the most radical speech of the conference. It was one of the most radical uh, of my, my career. Now, how did that blue suit influence change? Uh, Wayne Jennings brought a group of people from St. Paul to hear old Don give the Sunday morning sermon. And in the middle of my talk, uh, a, a light clicked, you know, among the group. Hey, we can have one of the gooniest schools in Minnesota, and we don't have to wear dungarees and, and lumberjack shirts and wear a beard. We don't have to wear granny dresses. It's okay to have a goonie school and still wear a tie. Because at Wilson, where I was, all of our male faculty still wore ties and so forth. I did all my time in Minnesota. Our women still wore skirts or nice pantsuits and so forth. Wilson was clean as a whistle. It wasn't like a free school, you know, like you, you, you kind of imagine. And so as a result of that, uh, Wayne took his group back and they started talking some more and they'd already been or organized talking for quite a while. And as a result of that blue suit, Wayne's famous St. Paul Open School became reality. So if we could do that back in 68, 69, 70, we can do it again in 2012. All it takes is a suit. <laughs> okay. All right.
The second part of the revolution, and I'm going to go on to the future, was what occurred at Wilson when I was there. Uh, in 1968, it was an egg crate cracker box, you know, that should have been closed. It wouldn't do anything. So when we came in, I came in, we made 69 changes overnight. I could be dictatorial in those days. I just did it. And we eliminated everything. We got rid of tests, we got rid of report cards, we got rid of requirements, we went year round, we, everything. We violated every single thing in the, edu in the education code passed by the legislature, except for health and safety you know, kinds of things. We violated every single requirement of the State Department of Education. For example, we refused to give state tests. We said we're going year round, and in those days, year round was illegal in Minnesota. We fought it for two years, and I cheated. Uh, ethically, you know, I counted days present when kids were there in July, and they took a vacation in January like they should, and get the heck out of Minnesota like any intelligent person would. <laughs> uh, so, you know, for two years, as a result of that, then the legislature banged around, and finally they changed from ADA to ADM. And it wasn't that great. It was so easy and so concise, but it made year-round legal. Those are the kinds of impacts that we began to have. Well, in the meantime, the legislature was getting a little upset with me because here we had the so-called National Recognition School, the most innovative school in the nation, doing everything wrong. We violated all the rules and regulations and didn't do what we're supposed to do. And so they called me up for a hearing. You know, Don, uh, we're going to check out you out, and you either have to conform to things or you're going to have to, we may take away your state aid. And that's another story. So, you know, we'll take away my state aid or we'll go to court. And I meant it, you know. Uh, but anyway, uh, in the discussion, they said, Don, you're causing all kinds of problems in Minnesota. And I said to them, to the legislature in their face, we wouldn't have these problems if you guys weren't such rinky-dinks. <laughs> made the headlines in every paper in Minnesota. And if you don't believe me, I got the prints right here, you know. Glines and legislatures have verbal blows, you know. Police state operation of schools, you know, recall. So we had a lot of fun. But as a result of that, they said, well, go back and write a letter and ask to be an experimental school. We did, and we continued to violate all the rules and regulations of Minnesota. And for all the years we were there, we didn't give any tests. We didn't give any report cards. We didn't have any required classes. You know, we went non-graded. We had a cradle-to-grade school written up in the, cradle, in the Christian Science Monitor. We had an infant program, a preschool program, uh, traditionally, you know, a K through 12 program. You had a bachelor's degree and a master's degree you could get at, approved by North Central Accrediting Association at Mankato State with no required classes. You created your own bachelor and master's degree. And so uh, these were the kinds of exciting things that were going on. Well, we got to get on to the future, but uh, I just want to let you know we did violate everything and we got away with it. And that started, you know, that was part. Those are just two examples of the Great Revolution between 68 and 71. Okay, now we've got to start the new revolution, and Figment's going to help us from now on. Because I'm getting old and worn out, I've got to use my glasses to, for the notes. I can't, I'm no longer Bill Clinton, where I can just get up and talk, you know, without a, uh, one of those things. Anyway. Uh, yeah, teleprompters, that's it, yeah. Okay, I'm going to suggest eight steps that we and MAP, and I talk, talk about we because I believe I'm part of MAP, I, I've got to do it too. I'm, a, I'm as much involved or blame or credit or whatever as anyone else. Uh, we're going to have eight steps, and then from, after that I'm going to tell you what these eight steps are going to lead to, what we're going to tell the legislature. But the first step is the easy one. We're going to change the name of MAP. You cannot have an alternative program. Figment has been so upset the last couple of days walking around the conference and all he's hearing about is alternative education. There's no such thing. Well, you have to add an S onto alternatives because then it becomes a choice. And the traditional school then, you see, becomes like us. It's one of the choices. It's one of the alternatives. 
So then whether you're a charter school or an ALC or a traditional school or an XYZ school or whatever you call yourself, you are one of the many options, the one choices, the one many alternatives that you can choose to do it. And what name are you going to change? Make it simple if you want to, just MALA instead of MAP, Minnesota Association for Learning Alternatives. Or MIA, Minnesota Education, uh, uh, Educators Ed Education Association. Or more, more fancy, you know, like EFLORA, uh, ed Educators for a Learning Options Association. It doesn't matter the name, but you're gonna, the important thing is that we change the structure of MAP uh, and the, our purpose and our, uh, alter our philosophy a little bit because we're no longer going to just represent MAP programs, MAP students, uh, our organization. We're going to represent the whole state. That's what uh, Education Exploration Center did. Like at the McAllister Conference I talked about, Anyone in the state was invited. We had people from all over every which way. It wasn't just, you know, a map. We've got to do it. Why? Even though you think we're small and so forth, uh, the Colonial Army at 1776 was small too. Uh, we can do it. Uh, the Battle of Midway, you know, overwhelming Japanese forces. No way the Americans could win. Yet we did. And that turned the war around in the Pacific in World War II. So small groups can create great things if we get busy and, and say we're going to do it and then, and then do it. And so the, uh, the, we're, the, see, the MEA won't do it at Minnesota's, you know, because they're worried about teacher tenure and those kind of things. The local unions won't do it. All they're concerned about is benefits and wages and stuff. They never strike for kids. Have you ever seen a, a union strike for kids? I never have. The legislature sure won't help us. They're just messing us up. You know, they're ruining things. And so we're going to have to take on the task as an organization and grow and get more people involved. And we're going to represent what needs to be in education in Minnesota. We're going to tell the politicians, we're going to run things, you're not. It's the politicians who are ruining things. They're lawyers, they're businessmen, they're farmers, you know, they don't know anything about learning. They know about schooling, the kind of junk they went through, but they don't know anything about learning, and we're going to tell them so. <clears throat> that's what we haven't been doing lately. So that's the first step. So first change <clears throat> map comes, I don't care what name you come up with, but it's not going to be map anymore, because we're not going to have alternative <laughs> programs, you know. It's got to be educational alternatives, and then build from there. Okay, second thing, we're going to talk to the legislature. I know some of you do on legislative day, the kids come in and they do a great job, but they're trying to protect our programs and keep going what we have and explain what we're doing and ask for support, you know, to let us continue our programs. Um, but we're going to tell them this time, hey, we're going to create a revolution. We really mean it. We're not going to let politicians control education anymore in Minnesota. We know more about learning than you do. We know more about how to deal with kids and how to help them and overcome achievement gaps and all these kind of things we're talking about now in Minnesota. Uh, so we're going to do it. So we're going to not hide. We're going to do like I did in Mankato. I just told the legislature that we're going to break all the laws, and if you don't like it, you know, we'll go to court. And so we got away with it. Uh, we're not, we're, we're not going to hide from them, in other words. Third, we're going to find a Democrat who can get to Obama. Maybe Mondell will help us. Mondell was down and visited uh, Wilson. Uh, so did Humphrey. Uh, Albert, as far as the Republicans, Albert Quee from the 1st District, uh, Bill Frenzel from the 3rd District, are all supportive you know, of Wilson at the time. So we had some friendly legislators at one time. Why do we need to get to Obama? We need to tell him to fire Duncan. You know, uh, uh, let him, let him go back and ruin the Chicago schools like he was, but don't mess up Minnesota schools, you see? And so, uh, but you know, somebody, see Obama's getting bad advice. He may not be a bad person, he may be doing a pretty good job overall. I voted for the silly guy. But uh, you know, that he's getting bad advice in terms of education. And we've got to find a way to get through to him and say, please listen to us. Let's hear the other side of the story 
at least to have him consider it, you know, and not just take race, you know, how awful, and we all know no child will be left behind is, race to the top is even worse. I mean, who in the world would want to race to the top, you know? You wear out. All right. Uh, okay. Um, fourth, we're going to seek support from the universities. Most of you went to a college here in Minnesota, good majority of you. You all know people at the university. You have some influence. You're alumni. You go back and talk. Hopefully, I started it setting an example. Monday, I spent at Minnesota State University, six hours. They did an oral history of me and the programs we had back in those days that will be out of the archive. But I also spent four hours with the new interim dean, Gene Hart. And all of you who are MSU graduates, you get busy and get rid of that committee and say, hire Gene Hart. She's just an interim, so she's afraid to rock the vote right now, but she's one of us. I talked to her for four hours, and it's everything that we're talking about here and the Matt believes in, she is agreeable, and she will help us and lead. And she'll be one of the university schools of education that will give us support. And if you go to the other colleges around the country, like Tom, Wayne for a short time did stuff at St. Thomas, you know, get St. Thomas involved. Ironically, back in the days of the revolution, the first one, St. Scholastica had one of the best programs in the state in terms of this kind of stuff that we're doing at the college level. So. Um, seek support. Okay, that's the fourth thing. The fifth thing, we're going to march on the state capitol. Call the city in, a march. I'm very serious. We're going to close school on Wednesdays and say we're not going to have school open. Do it on Saturday if you have to. But we're going to gather on the state that 600 members of MAP. We're going to get 600 parents and students. We're going to get another 400 or so from union leaders that are against t uh, testing because of evaluating teachers, uh, people from the universities. Get everybody we can. I'm very serious. We're going to tell everybody we're doing it. We're going to get police permits and all those things. But we're going to have 1,500, 2,000 of us on the state steps at the Capitol. And we're going to tell the politicians, this is the new revolution. We're taking over. And if you don't like it, then we'll just have to go to war, I guess, over this. Because uh, we're not going to let you as lawyers and businessmen and farmers tell us who are experts in learning you know, what we ought to be doing. And in doing this, we're going to get CNN, the New York Times, Marianne's going to get the Washington Post out here. Um, we're going to get all the papers on Minnesota. But we're all going to, we want a big splash nationally. We want everybody in the country to know we're doing it. Minnesota, you see, used to be the most innovative state in the union in terms of education and new ideas and the Wilson kind of things and so forth. We were doing it all over the state. It wasn't just Wilson. Ours was just one of the things that was spotlighted. St. Paul Open School, you know, on down the line. We had a whole bunch of stuff, you know, going on. Even Staples had a great little program going. So, uh... <laughs> The, I was all over the state. When I left here, I was working at 21 school districts in Minnesota who were trying to get the board to approve Wilson-type schools for their districts. Um, so we're not, uh, Duluth was involved, St. Louis Park was involved, you know, Bloomington was involved. So it wasn't just, you know, Don or Wayne. It was, we, statewide, we were doing great things. And uh, we're going to, Colorado will join us, for example. Colorado, ironically, was the second most innovative state in the Union, right along with it. They had all kinds of neat things going on in Colorado. They're like us now. They're down at the bottom in terms of innovation and change. They've got a group now called Uniting for Kids that's out fighting the state to get rid of... they got the worst state test than we've got. You know, it's horrible, and they're against No Child Left Behind and all that kind of thing. So if, we, if people around the country know that Minnesota is going to change and do everything and, and create the revolution. We know people from Colorado and lots of other states, New York and so forth. 700 principals in New York signed a petition, you know, to get rid of the no child left behind kind of nonsense. So we're not talking fantasy here. and We're talking things we can do in a reality kind of base. And we will have support. People will look to us again 
like they did in the 68, 71 kind of period where thousands flocked here. From all, we have people from every province in Canada come in. Almost every, people from all 50 states came in to see what was going on in Minnesota. We want that again because we want the best for our kids and our programs you know, statewide. And if somebody wants to have a traditional school, I don't care. I'll, I'll support it with my tax money if it's by choice. If the parents and the students and the kids in a so-called traditional school want to be in that kind of program, fine. See, it's one of the many alternatives. It's not the regular school versus the alternative school, you see? And that's where we got ourselves in trouble. We started calling ourselves, we're the alternative. Alternative to what? Alternative to what you're supposed to do? Alternative to the regular school? Why do we inherit all the so-called bad kids? Like one of the things we're gonna talk about is get rid of the stupid ALC law that's you gotta be bad in 11 ways to get into the best schools in the state, you know? <laughs> it, 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 it doesn't make any sense. Uh, we're going to, uh, we're, uh, oh, the other thing, we're going to create a new version of Wilson. See, one of the things that math's done wrong, you don't have any elementary kids involved like you should. If, if we're going to show how it ought to be in Minnesota, we've got to show what we can do in early childhood and, and, and elementary. All this reading kind of nonsense going on. Like in the Tribune on Sunday, uh, it had in there that uh, kids are behind when they enter kindergarten. How can I get me behind before they start, you know? It's utter nonsense, you know? They don't know anything about teaching reading, you know? Sure, I want these kids to read. We all want to read, you know, uh, for our kids. But, well, we'll get into the reading later. No charge, for, <laughs> no, no charge for that. But if I came back to Minnesota to run another school, I want to run the 2012 version of Wilson. I want cradle-to-grave learning. See, we're representing all learners in Minnesota. And we had a senior citizen program at Wilson, too. Uh, so we started at pre-birth because you didn't, know how to be a parent by just getting pregnant or getting somebody pregnant. So we had a preschool, a pre-birth program, we had an infant program, we had an early childhood program, the so-called K through 12 programs, and the college programs, and then we had a senior citizen program. So you could start at Wilson before birth and die as a, you know, a senior, as a golden <laughs> ager, in the same facility. Well, and we had a football team, by the way. <laughs> And I even coached it one year because the coach resigned at the last minute in August. You know, nobody on the staff could coach. So besides running the school, I was the football coach. Uh, and we had basketball team. We went to the finals, if you remember, in 1976. Wilson lost by one point winning the state championship. They'd never done that as a traditional school. They did it when we did. We didn't give grades. We didn't give report cards, you know. Everybody was eligible. <laughs> But, but anyway, um, okay, I would, I, I would not come back to Minnesota and run a map pro school. That doesn't mean you're bad or wrong, I mean, you're doing great things, I know that, and you know it. It's not what I believe, you see. I believe we need to be open to everybody. Anyone ought to come to the kinds of programs that we offer, K through 12. We need input in the elementary programs. We need to show what we can do with uh, the, the kinds of programs that we would develop for the young kids. So if anybody's got a place for, uh, that's covered on geodesic domes, like we were gonna have the Minnesota Experimental City, uh, the Lucky Fuller designed for us, so year-round climate control, I'll come back. <laughs> and and we'll, we'll have the new Wilson in a, under a geodesic dome. All right. The skyways are going around there. These got started in Minneapolis because of the, um, the, the plans for the Minnesota Experimental City. We tried to take over Minneapolis because uh, the people in Minneapolis uh, didn't want uh, Minneapolis to become like Chicago and New York and, and Los Angeles. Well, we fought the battle, but we lost because we wanted to get rid of cars in Minneapolis. We wanted to put a dome over part of the city and so forth. Well, anyway, the short along was Politicians got in their way and we didn't do it. So okay, we'll develop a new uh, city. We had all the plans going. Uh, we were within a year of breaking ground. And that's where I was gonna live 
and be the education coordinator for the city, but a city of 250,000 people with no schools. And we planned this in 1970. It was all ready to go. I've still got the plans, a copy of them. And we didn't have computers, and we didn't have cell phones, iPods, Facebooks. I don't even understand that stuff, you know. But uh, uh, think of what we could do now, you know, with the MXC. But we knew we could bring more learning, better, faster, more efficiently to 250,000 people, the kids of those, uh, and the learners. It was a lifelong learning system, you see from birth to death, with, do better without schools and without universities. And so this is a, a part of the, well, enough of that. Okay, what are we going to tell the legislature then? Uh, what are we going to demand when we meet with them and we have our march? Here are some of the things we're going to do. We're going to tell them, get rid of that stupid requirement called Algebra 1 and Algebra 2. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and what we're going to do, we're going to do, you, we as MAP, and so, Organization. We're going to do like I did at, at Wilson. I'm not going to require some silly thing like that. And you have no research, no evidence that makes any difference about how algebra is going to help anybody, you know. It's a stupid obsolete course. We threw it out at Wilson 50, 45, 50 years ago. Um, but if you are going to teach algebra, remember we're talking about options? So suppose some school or some student wanted to uh, take algebra for whatever reason, or some school wanted to teach it. That's okay, but it's an option, it's a choice. It's not a requirement, you see, for the kids to come in. And then if you're going to have algebra, we've uh, proven the MIT Caltech kids, even some of them going to the University of Minnesota Engineering School, can learn algebra in six weeks. Give them a book, get out of their way, and I can guarantee you, if you don't believe me, try it with some of those, your better math students. And they can come in in six weeks and pass the national algebra test at close to 100 percentile. But you gals, the stereotype, who are going to be Peace Corps workers and you know, uh, be sociology majors, uh, you may need to know about politics, about radicals and politics, but you don't need to know anything about radicals and algebra. So what we're going to do is get rid of it, and your schools are going to refuse to teach, algebra, require Algebra 1 and 2. We're going to tell the legislature so, and we're going to get that darn law revoked, because they have no research whatsoever that it makes any sense for anyone to take algebra, unless you want to do it for fun. Why don't we require Latin? If you want to take Latin for fun, fine. But Latin used to be required you know, to get into Yale and Harvard. How come it's not required anymore? Well, algebra is the same kind of obsolete course that Latin is. Okay, number two. Uh, we're going to say no to the state tests. We're not going to give any state tests in our programs. And if you want to come after us, fine, we'll take you to court for segregation. Back in my days uh, in Minnesota, 49% were Catholic and 49% were Lutheran. And the 2% of us who were neither held the balance of power. We prevented, you know, the war in Minnesota at that time. I, but I told the legislature, we don't separate the Catholics from Lutherans, you know, at Wilson. We don't separate the minorities from majorities. We don't have any minorities in those days. But we're not going to separate the smarties from the dummies. And that's all that tests, grade point averages, class rank, Carnegie units, all that kind of nonsense. All it does is, you're a smarty, you're a dummy, and we'll have no part of segregation. You can call me Lutheran, red, pink, you know. Uh, but don't call me dummy. And so we meant it. And they knew we meant it. And we were ready to go to court if they tried to do anything about it. So we never gave the state tests in, 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 at Wilson except one year. And ironically, we had no requirements. We didn't require reading in kindergarten or third grade or whatever. We had 23 reading programs at Wilson. It had because we had to have the fit the program to the child, not the child of the program. And uh, where, where was I? Anyway, um, well, that's that's a, that's the next item. Um, okay, we're gonna get, you know tell them no. We're not gonna do no child left behind. We're not gonna be involved in a race to the top. We don't want to be involved in all that kind of nonsense. Uh, we'll be accountable. 
but we're not going to do it by reading the math scores and everybody's a, a number, you know, instead of, it's like every child left behind, not no child left behind, because all he became was a number, you know. Uh, what is your math score? What's your reading score? Oh, you're a smarty, you're a dummy. And, you know, we all know whether you can read or not. You know, just ask the kids. Are they taxidermists? Ask them to stuff the bird, you know, if, you're, if you have any doubt. All right. Okay. Number three. We're going to say no to silly curriculum requirements in the state. Uh, the eight-year study proved in the 1930s it makes no difference what courses you take in high school related to success in college and success in life. In fact, the schools in the eight-year study that were the gooniest had the best overall results, you know, later on. And so we know that all these mandated courses and so forth don't make any sense. At Wilson, we applied it at the elementary level, too because the eight-year study was a secondary you know, study, done by the best education researchers in the country. And it's fabulous research. Five volumes. Wayne's got a copy of them, if you want to read them. Uh, and uh, it, it, it got lost because of World War II, because the eight-year study started in 1932, finished in 1940. By the time the results came out, it was 1942. And what was more important? Midway, you see, at the time. Well. Okay, uh, but no requirements. No to reading for all kids in kindergarten. The research in reading is quite clear. Most kids learn any to read anywhere from age three to age 13. It doesn't make any difference. Uh, they don't have to be ready for the fourth grade. You know, they're behind if they're in the third grade. Sure, they're behind if they haven't started. You know, uh, so uh, the, the research is clear. And um, the, uh, isn't it great we don't teach walking and talking in our schools? <laughs> Think of all the remedial classes we'd have in walking and talking like we do in remedial reading. Well, anyway, we know that the way to teach reading traditionally doesn't work for most kids. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a reading gap. So you've got to do it differently. You start the kids when they're ready. Not when we say they're ready. When the kids indicate they're ready, that's easy to do. And then take them at their own pace. Let them progress their own pace. You know, the best place we found to teach reading for kids that were kind of slowly moving into it at Wilson was in home economics. We had a beautiful home ec program. It was the most beautiful program in, in our school. Uh, better than English, better than science. We had 57 animals at Wilson. We had two monkeys, a boa constrictor, and you name all the rest, you know. They went to class too, because they had to learn. All right. Um, but, uh, you know, the, in home economics, the kid would come down, little kid would come down, all excited. Oh, I'm going to make some brownies. Okay, teacher. Uh, can I make some brownies? Yeah. I'm busy right now, Billy. Here, here's a biscuit box. Go start reading the recipe. Get started and I'll come help you. Come back, tugs on you again. But, but I can't read it. Oh, well, go see Helen over in the corner. Helen, who would have been traditionally our reading specialist, moved all of her stuff, lock, stock, and barrel, to the home ec room. And so when little Billy came over to get help, Helen, could you help me? Oh, we were all by first name at Wilson. Uh, uh, could you help me? Oh, well, I think so. Let's see. What do we want to do? Stir, blend, mix, tablespoonful, one third cupful. Became a great reading lesson. And the kids had fun and they enjoyed it. They weren't reading, they were making brownies. And you let them progress on that way, you see. So, this whole idea that you have to have a reading program, a uh, textbook, is silly. All right, we're going to go on. Uh, we're going to say no to mandated grade levels. The most stupid thing is, as uh, Craig said in the introduction about my campaign as a seventh grade, it's the worst, most horrible thing ever invented. It's worse than the Inquisition. It's worse than the Middle Ages, uh, dungeons, you know, of the Middle Ages, you know, kind of thing. No child should ever be sentenced to the seventh grade, you know. Uh, it, it, if you had elementary kids, you'd flunk them all in the sixth grade. You wouldn't let them go to the seventh grade, you see. It, it is. It's horrible. I've done three-day workshops. The first day, we have the evidence how terrible the seventh grade is. Then the next day, we say, well, what should we do about it to get ready to replace it? And then we talk about uh, how do you implement it? How do you do it differently? 
people don't realize, but and here's the proof we have. You see, we have evidence for all this stuff that the uh, seventh grade kinds of kids, the ones we call seventh grade, physiologically are spread six years. That's medical evidence. Talk to any orthopedic surgeon you find in town. They will verify this. Some kids physiologically are only fifth and sixth graders, you know, traditionally in physical development. Some are eighth and ninth graders. They're ready for the Vikings. You know, <laughs> might, maybe for the 49ers, because they're better now. You know? <laughs> but uh, we know achievement tests, look at your state test. The test results are spread 10 years from grade three to grade 13. Some kids are scoring on the state test with all this emphasis on world-class standards and rubrics and all that. And I didn't know what a rubric is, you know? People don't talk about rubrics. Um, world-class standards. Um, we don't, uh, I, I keep, see, I'm getting old. I keep having these senior moments, you know? Get started on something. Anyway, the, um, physically, the, uh, the, oh, the achievement-wise, the kids are spread 10 years. Some are third, fourth, fifth grade. Some are 11th, 12th, 13th grade. You see, they're like, how the blazes name do you have a seventh grade? There ain't no such animal. There really isn't. You know, at most, if you wanted to call to call it seventh grade norm, maybe 10, 15 percent might fall in that norm. The other 80 percent are spread, and you know it, and I know it, and everybody knows it. Well, we're going to tell the legislature that. Get rid of the grades. In a non-grade, traditional school can still have first, second, third grade, can still have period one, two, three. As dumb as those things are, the self-contaminated classroom should have been eliminated years ago, you know? But uh, if they want to have it, remember it's a choice, it's one of the alternatives, but we're not going to have a graded school. See, we're going to, all the kids are mixed together, and Wilson, Kate, kindergarten kind of kids, seventh grade kind of kids, health rate kind of kiddies, college kind of kiddies, all were in the same room, same environment, same philosophy, same staff, same everything. They taught each other, they helped each other, they intermingled. And many of the kindergarten kids taught the high school kids. Like when we taught the Choctaw language, because we were going down to the Choctaw Reservation, high school students from Choctaw Reservation taught the course. We had kids from K through 12 traditionally in the Choctaw program. Guess who? If we gave A's and B's and C's those days, we didn't. But who got the A's? The kindergarten, first and second grade kids. See, they weren't inhibited by the speech. Oh, blah, blah, blah. They just talk about it. What did our seniors are going down to visit, you know, and juniors? Ooh, ooh, ho, ho. They couldn't do it, you see. So uh, we know the way we teach foreign languages is about as stupid as you can come up with. Uh, you know, we have a formula for literacy in foreign languages, the way we teach it now in our secondary schools. Five times nine times two, or well, times 55. In other words, five days a week, 55 minutes a day for nine months times two years. Now you're illiterate, you can't read or speak the language, but you're eligible for the University of Minnesota. <laughs> All right, well, we've got to stop here somewhere along the line. Um, and then I mentioned before, we are going to change the ALC codes. We are going to get rid of those stupid 11 ways of being bad. We're going to open the ALCs up to anyone that wants to attend. Uh, it's by choice. If the learning style, if the program, the philosophy, the staff, and so forth fit that student or that family and so forth, then they ought to be able to go. Why should you have to be bad to be good? Why do you have to be, be worst before you can be in the best, you see? And it's just absolutely stupid the way we've allowed that to continue. Might have been all right when they first got a pass just to get it started, but it's way out of date and it needs to be eliminated. It's no way to treat kids. You've got to be bad to be good. All right. uh, we're going to reform the charter school concept. I'm glad to hear Blue Sky won. But the charter school, you'll remember, started in Minnesota. 1991, but the concept was we're going to open it up to everything. You can have Goonie schools like Wilson, you can have a traditional school, you can have a military academy, you know, you can have some kind of in-between school, a Montessori school, whatever you want. It was by choice, by options, by philosophy. No one signed up for it. You didn't have the charter school. And the charter schools are too small. 
you know, and so the ALC is too small for a lot of them. Now, for some specific programs, small is okay. Remember, Wilson has 600 kids, and we would have been glad to have more. You can do this in a school of 2,400. We've done it before. This kind of program we're talking about, the Wilson. Very personalized, very individualized, the kind of things you're doing. But when you only have 50 or 200 kids, like most of our programs have now, you don't have the facilities. It, at Wilson, we were lucky, you see. We had a regular so-called school building. We had two gymnasiums. We had science labs. We had music centers. We had art places. We had all kinds of things. When you're down to being a very small school, you lack facilities. You lack options. The more, like 600, the more things you can offer then. You can have great home ec programs. You can have great industrial arts programs. You can have all these good things because you've got enough staff and kids and so forth to be able to intermingle. They don't teach departmentalization either. Remember that uh, 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 T.H. Huxley in 1890 told us knowledge is not segmented, it's interdependent. You can't have separate departments. You can't have separate courses. You can't have separate, it's got to be interwoven. Okay. Um, we're going to have the legislature pass legislation that says that every district in the state ought to have some choices or options. And you can do it in any size school district, even a little one-room schoolhouse. Wayne and I put together a book for Ayala called Educational Alternatives for Everyone. We list 30 ways to create alternatives. We have diagrams for 10 of those, you know, in terms of reality, the kind of facilities you have now and so forth. And so we know we can do it. It doesn't cost any more money. It just, it doesn't, you know, we break the state laws for a while until we get the new legislation passed. But the idea is, in any size district in Minnesota, you can offer more than one school, more than one choice, more than one option. You can offer alternatives. You may not have 30, you know, going, but you're going to have two or three or four, depending on the, on the district and the size. And so, but we need legislation that allows Wilson-type schools to be available in every district in the state, if there's a, you know, the parents want them. Uh, we know that uh, MAP are Pied Piper kind of people, so there's no problem on this teacher tenure kind of stuff and who should be fired. Kind of Michelle Ree comes back to Minnesota again, kick her out, you know. Uh, that's, you know, she is so, bad. I'm, I'm talking about her personally, she's married to our mayor, uh, but you know, she got fired from, Minnesota, from Washington, D.C. Her, uh, hundred, over 100 of her schools are under indictment for fraud, for cheating on the tests and so forth. You don't listen to Michelle. You know, the whole idea is of closing schools and uh, firing teachers and all that kind of stuff. It's just terrible wrong and we all know it. So you got to tell the legislature, you listen to us, you don't listen to Michelle Ree because she doesn't have the right ideas or visions for Minnesota. Okay, well, I got to, geez. Okay. Uh, is this, Im does all this sound impossible? No. Why not? The answer, the figment would give us, is the one that Bob Theobald gave us. It's time to do the impossible. The possible is no longer working. Uh, do we have a model? of risk. Yeah. Remember the famous Hundred Years' War in 1430? Joan of Arc at age 19 donned her white suits of, a white suit of armor and risk and led the French to victory at Orléans. What you young whippersnappers out in the audience need to do is get out your white suits of armor and then make us old timers get out our graying, full faded old white suits of armor we got stored away in the attic and get us all together and we're all going to put on some form of white suit of armor and we're going to do like Joan of Arc. We're going to lead us to victory as Joan did at Orléans. It can be done. Um, was 1776 wrong, like I mentioned? You know, little small colonial army, no chance of beating the British. But we did it. We mentioned Midway, you know, was that, how do we win that? Would it be wrong to have a revolution in, seven, in 2012? We had one in 1776. We had one in education in 1968. 
What's wrong with doing it again? Okay, no more pens. We've written too many books. We've got so, over 300 books. I, I could list you off maybe a thousand, but even going back to 1913, Edmund Holmes wrote The Tragedy of Education. He'd been the education minister in England for 30 years, implementing traditional schools, and he realized he was wrong. And he resigned and turned around, apologized to the people in England, said, I'm sorry I hurt so many of you, I did wrong. I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to overcome the mistakes that I caused. 1913, the tragedy of education, and what's he describing? Today's traditional schools in Minnesota. Well, we've had too many tongues, too. So too many pens, too many writing. People writing all the time about what we ought to do or what we could do or so forth. But what, what happens? We have too many tongues. We've had thousands of speeches. You, know, like you brought Marion and, and uh, uh, Kristen and myself in. For what for? You know, you know all this kind of stuff. You know, we talk, and like Marion and I were talking about, we, you know, it's fun to do this. It's good for the ego and so forth. And hopefully we pass a few ideas on. But you don't need us because we come back next year and Marion and I could give the same talk. Because in most cases, nothing's happened. So we don't need any more tongues. You can limit all your speakers next year. Look at all the money and time you'd save. <laughs> I, um, okay. Margaret Mead gave us the answer whether we can do this or not. She said, my grandmother wanted me to have a good education, so she kept me out of school. We want to keep kids out of schooling. We want to help kids be involved in learning. And so the new revised map with a new direction representing all the state, we're going to do it. We're going to create a learning kind of program for Minnesota that will enhance the pro what we're doing now for all the kids in Minnesota. And we are going to create the second great education revolution in Minnesota. Thank you. I would just like to say one thing. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Don't move back there. Don't move. One thing. Where's the media? You're leaving the pews, members. You just heard a superstar. Nobody else heard it. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Don. We've been really fortunate. I mean, we have heard three wonderful speakers this year, and they've all sent very deliberate messages. So please, please continue to spread the word. On behalf, Don, of our organization, our members, I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much. You've been an inspiration to many of us for many years. And we've got a gift from Minnesota <laughs> for you to take back to California. But just don't drop the spam. <laughs> Thanks, Don. Thank you. Thank you.